Praise the Lord. I love the singing here at Temple Baptist Church. It's always delightful. And it's scriptural. I like that. My text verse is from Matthew 26 and verse number 39 this morning. And it says about our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he went a little further. He went a little further. Disciples had fell asleep. Maybe they didn't value prayer as they should. But our Lord was a prayer warrior. And he prayed all through the night watches. He went a little farther. I love the song, In the Garden. I love that song. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on mine ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. As I said two weeks ago, I don't think that you can go to the cross experience in your life without having a Gethsemane experience. The cross experience in your life is the victory experience because Christ won the victory at the cross. Gethsemane is needed if we're going to gain the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe that we spend enough time in prayer, church. I just want to be honest about myself. We talk more to man than we do talking to God. God wants us to build a relationship with him. The Apostle Paul put it this way, I die daily. He met up with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road and he knew what it was to meet the Master and have a relationship with him. He said, I must crucify myself daily. I must mortify the deeds of this body. It's basically a spiritual metamorphosis, if you will. The old worm that spins its silk in the cocoon, it comes out looking not like a worm, not like we start out as when we begin this Christian endeavor. No, but it comes out floating out, flying over the problems, the circumstances. That's how we win the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. We do it through prayer. We do it by tarrying still, as the disciples were told, tarry still in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. We need that power today. Can I tell you that there's nothing greater than prayer? Prayer is the key element of our faith. Prayer is what changes things. There is no problem that God and prayer can't change. I believe that. In our text today, in verse number 39, it says, he went a little further. <laughs> I'm reminded, reminded of this song. Father along, we'll understand it. Father along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. I love that old song. The next time you feel like giving up and giving in to this old sinful world and throwing in the towel, whatever. <laughs> you ever get there, Christian? Remember the Lord went all the way to Calvary for you by going a little further. I want to speak on the subject this morning. He went a little farther. He went a little farther. I want to say first of all today when the pressure was on, he went a little farther. This is when you ought to pray more when the pressure is on. In your busiest, most hectic, hardest, uh, most terrible day that you have, and the, the most terrible experiences you have on this earth, and yes, we all have them. Man that is born a few days is uh, that is born of woman is a few days and of what full of trouble. T uh, trouble with a capital T. You will have trouble. This is when you ought to pray more. I'm talking about your hardest days, your saddest days, your most ugliest experiences on life. You don't want to stay in the flesh on those days. You want to get in the spirit of the Most High God. You want to rise up above your circumstances, please. You don't want to drink of that bitter cup of suffering. I know, I don't either. But you have to go to the garden, and sometimes alone. You must go to the garden of prayer. You want to retire from your Sunday school class, I know. I have that feeling. 
or the, cl- or the choir or the ensemble or, or the bus route. You, you want to give up. You want to throw in the towel. Can I tell you that those ministries that you have been involved with through the years, uh, they're there for your good. It's the best therapy there is. It will help alleviate the suffering and the pain that you're going through by helping others in the pain that they're going through. We're talking about the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling the sinner to the Savior. And without a garden prayer life, you will end your service for God. Satan wants you to stop. Satan wants you to quit. Let's let him know this morning that we're not about quitting. We don't have it within us because we have God in our heart. We have Jesus Christ as our Savior. Jesus did not quit. He went a little farther. That's what the Bible says. I'm saying without a garden of Gethsemane, your life will implode. Your life will disintegrate as we know it. Without a garden prayer life, you'll never know the Golgotha victory and the victorious Christian life as a Christian. So when the pressure was on, he went a little farther. I'm going to say secondly, when your will seemingly cannot or will not be broken, he went a little farther for you. For the disciples' life was not any different uh, for them. <laughs> That's why maybe they did not need a prayer meeting. Yet it was for them that he would be dying for, Jesus Christ for the sins of the whole world. He not only died for our sins, but the Bible says in the book of 1 John, but for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world were placed upon our Christ that day. Does that mean anything to you? (laughs) I'm telling you what, I'm so thankful that I don't have my sins on my record anymore. I have the record of Jesus Christ. I'm going to heaven today because of the record of Jesus Christ. I'm going to heaven today because of the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. I like Brother Mircius Church, his uh, First Baptist Church of Constanza, Romania, his whole old home church. It says it on, in the church, it says, but we preach Christ and him crucified. Am I right? That's what we need to get back to. We need to preach Christ. We need to think about what he did, what he went through for us to have what we have here this morning. The beautiful life that we have would not have been possible had it not been for the man who went a little farther for you and for me. Amen. So the next time you have the big event, the decision that you need to make, the change in life or whatever it is, uh, don't leave it to chance. Don't uh, flip a coin to see whether or not or what you should do. Pray all night as our Lord did. Have a time, a garden Gethsemane prayer time. Amen. Go the extra mile, in other words. Do what Jesus, hey, you know, used to, years ago, they'd have little bracelets. What would Jesus do? That's what he did. He went to the garden alone. No one else was praying, but Jesus was praying. He went the extra mile. Will we go the extra mile? Will we let God work in our life? Or will we just throw it up for for grabs and just ruin our life and, and quit this Christian life? We cannot stop, folks. We cannot quit living this Christian life. So his will. He said, not my will. Jesus said that. Our greatest example in the garden, the all-night prayer meeting, he said, not my will but thine be done. His will was removed and it was broken. And the Father's will was done. That's what needs to happen in our life. You pray all night long, I promise you, you'll come away broken. Your life will be surrendered. I tell you about 99.9% of the problems in this world, all of our failures are prayer failures. Dr. John R. Rice said that. I believe that. I believe if we get through to God and if we get along with God and we get our spirit uh, like the Lord's spirit and we would break our will for his will, there'd be no problems on this earth. We'd walk with God and we'd know what to do. 
We wouldn't quit and we wouldn't give up. And I want to say when your will seemingly cannot or will not be broken, he went a little farther for you. Thirdly, and lastly, somebody say amen. When, I knew I'd get an amen out of him. Thirdly, when you feel betrayed by your friends, he went a little further. The betrayal of a friend doesn't feel good. I was reading Psalm 55 and verse number 12 this morning. And you know, it was the Lord no doubt talking about Judas hundreds of years before it happened. But, but you know, God in his uh, timeless, endless, eternal life, he knows the end from the beginning. He could see it coming hundreds of years down the road. He could see Judas coming to that garden and kissing him on the cheek and making him and known by these men that would come and hail him and take him over into the dungeon. The betrayal of a friend. He hugged his neck. Can I tell you, he hugged the man who would betray him and his friend kissed him on the cheek and Jesus said about him, my friend. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the Lord would ever lie? I believe he loved Judas as much as he loved any of the other disciples. I believe that he died and shed his blood for Judas as much as he shed his blood for anyone else. Judas had the chance to repent of this doings, but he would not do so. He went through with it. Oh, listen, my friend today, our Lord... My, our Lord today had great love, not just for the ones who loved him. Our Lord had love for everyone, even those who uh, betrayed him, even those who had railing accusations against him. You know what he was doing in the garden? He was praying for them. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We use that verse there and we say, oh, oh, oh pastor, uh, oh, we're human and we, 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 uh, uh, we, we don't pray as our Lord and we don't act as our Lord. That's a cop out. We need to look to the Lord. We need to look to this example in the Bible, this Gethsemane prayer, and we need to do as the Lord did. He didn't retaliate evil for evil. The lynch mob who came out to him with staves and knives in their hands and they were angry. He didn't retaliate. He could have called 10,000 legions of angels, but he did not so. He loved those people. They asked the question, are thou uh, the Christ? Are you Jesus? The answer, I am. So powerful when he said it, it blew those soldiers backwards. He could have left there invisibly. He could have done all manner of things, but he did not. He went a little farther that night. Why did he do that for you and I? Had he not gone to the cross, we would not have eternal life today. Had he not gone to the cross, we wouldn't have the, the, the precious salvation that we have and heaven awaiting us one day. He went a little farther that night in prayer. Why? He knew those men would come. Why? Why did he go to prayer in Gethsemane? Because he knew that his humanity could not stomach what his tears would do to him that day but he could do it with the spirit man that we have availability to today he could do it we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth us isn't that what the scripture says so he had to separate the physical from the supernatural work he came to accomplish he had to be friends with those that came to do him in in other words the Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Do you believe that? Peter said, now we, we talked about Judas, but now let's talk about the rest of the disciples. Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny thee. Be careful when you say never. <laughs> I'm going to just say it this way. Never say never. You don't know what your flesh will do. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, uh, my flesh is awfully weak. How about yours? Amen. Don't, don't say that you're always going to stand for right and truth and God and holiness and righteousness and these things we know we ought to stand for. You don't know what you would do in this time. Uh, if you were there as these disciples were, you'd probably have done the same thing. 
Because, hey, you know what? They knew that if they held Jesus away and they took him away and they placed him on a cross, they knew they would probably be placed upon a cross because they were followers of Jesus Christ. While many that would cry, crucify him, crucify him, think about it this way. Peter, the disciple, the leader of the disciples, if you will, denied the Lord that, that day. But what about those who cried, crucify him, crucify him? The irony in all of this. Do you know that the ones that said these things would accept him, many of them, as their Savior and their Lord? Why? Because our Lord went a little farther. He died for everyone. He loves everyone. He's a friend of the sinner. Amen. No man could um, comprehend the love, the undying love that our Lord had for sinners. Oh, I love that about our God. Even the man who came with a sword uh, and uh, uh, Peter uh, scoped him out. He knew what he was going to do. And Peter pulled his sword out and he chopped off Malchus's ear. He wasn't aiming for his ear, folks. I believe Peter was aiming for his head. <laughs> he missed it somehow. <laughs> now look, you remember what our Lord did? He picked up Malchus's ear and he put it back on his head. He healed the one who came with a sword to take his life. That's the love of Jesus Christ. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Isn't God's grace still amazing? I haven't got over salvation. How about you? I'm still excited about what my Lord did on the cross of Calvary. How about you? When those came to place their hands on our Lord Jesus Christ by force, he went a little farther. When people come for you, literally or figuratively, go a little farther with them. Pray a little bit longer for them. When our Savior was led away to Caiaphas Hall to be tried by a kangaroo court there, where they had two false witnesses to testify against this innocent one. What a frightful day that was. A day where, where his all people went against him and smote him with their palms and slapped him, if they would, with the open palm, and they spit upon him. Our Lord Jesus Christ, they spit spittle in his face. Yet our Lord went a little farther. When they placed a crown of thorns on his head, they went deep down into his brow. Can I tell you, blood came out of our Lord's brow that day, but our Lord just kept going. He went a little farther. When they mocked him and asked him if he were king of the Jews, they placed a reed in his hand. They got down on their knees and they bowed and they mocked him as being king of the Jews with a robe, a scarlet robe on his back. And they mocked him and they jeered him and they persecuted him. They bowed down as if he were some sort of emperor of something. Can I tell you, our Lord went a little farther. When he was tied to a post and it pleased the Lord, it says in uh, Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and by his stripes we are healed. Somebody say amen. amen. He went a little farther. When he was drugged to the cross to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place of death, our Lord, he went a little farther. When he was given vinegar to drink, to kill the pain of all of his suffering, of all of his pain. Our Lord, he went a little farther. When they cast lots at the foot of the cross, gambling for his very vesture, for his very clothing that he wore there that day, he was stripped naked and humiliated in front of all. Our Christ did not stop there. He went a little farther. When they said over his head in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. He went a little farther. When they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross, he openeth not his mouth. He was as a sheep to the slaughter. Our Lord, he went a little farther. When they raised that cross and they dropped it in the ground and every bone came out of joint of our Savior that day and he was in excruciating pain. Our Lord openeth not his mouth. He went a little farther. 
you get the message today? <laughs> when they said he trusted in God, let him deliver him now. They saw him there and his body was all hanging there and it was all out of proportion and his back was completely riveted by the cat of nine tails which took the very flesh of our Savior off of his back and the entrails and the organs of our Lord were laid exposed to the elements and there he was in front of the whole humanity and he was raised between heaven and earth and he didn't open his mouth. He went a little farther. He went a little farther for you. He went a little farther for me. Because he knew that we would need a Savior. I believe I'll just keep on keeping on with the Lord. <laughs> when they offered him more vinegar to drink for the pain, he went a little farther. When he would rise up in the arch position as he was there on the cross without strength, but yet to breathe and to say anything, the seven sayings of the cross, he would arch his body like this and he would raise himself up. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. The interpretation of that Hebrew saying was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He went a little farther when his own heavenly father forsook him for you and for me. He went a little farther. And the dogs would come and gnaw on his legs, the prince of glory now. He was treated like no man. His visage was so marred, the scripture says he did not become a human being. He could not be seen as a human being. I'm saying our Lord went through all of that. Surely we can go through what we're going through. When they cried one last time, let us see. They heard him say, Eli, Eli. Let us see if Elias will come. They didn't understand what he was saying. And save him after he said this. But nothing faced him, all because of the Gethsemane prayer life. Then and only then, in Matthew 27, verse number 50, he gave up the ghost. No man took his life. He freely gave his life as a ransom for all. Three days exactly from Matthew 27, verse number 50, he would fulfill that verse. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the victor from a dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He went a little farther. He wasn't found in the empty tomb. His body was not here. He is not here as you suppose. The angel said he is risen. <laughs> what do you think? Look, you'll never make it as far as you would. Until you learn the great lesson that our Lord did for us that day, he went a little farther. He kept on going, in other words. You'll never learn how to have a transformation process in your life. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You'll never have that kind of transformation process until you find a Gethsemane prayer time. We've got to pray more, folks. We do everything. We shoot at the hip. We shoot at the lip. We let things go. We, we do things to people. We say things that are not right. We, we tear up people's uh, 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 peaceful life. All because we don't have a prayer life. This whole world is divided and all kinds of problems are going on in the world all because people don't know how to pray anymore. Our Lord taught us how to pray. I want that kind of prayer life. I want to be able to talk to my God. I want to be able to know he's pulling for me. He's in my corner. How about you? Proverbs 15 and verse 33, and I am almost done. Before honor is humility. Hey, you having a hard time lately? Maybe God's trying to humble you. Maybe you got too much pride. Remember, if you will, the resolve and the resilience and the revigoration of our Lord Jesus Christ all because he went a little farther. You think you can go a little farther with God? I think we all can today. 
I want to invite you to come to this altar and say, Lord, help me to go a little farther. I want to invite you to this altar today if you've never been saved by the grace of God and say, God, I've come to this place in my life and I'm here in this church this morning and I've heard all the things that Christ has done for me. Surely I can go a little farther. Surely I can come down this aisle and receive Christ as my Savior. I dare you today to trust Christ as your Savior. I had a man yesterday that close to getting saved and he said, Pastor, he said, there's something in my life that I know that I have to give up. He was thinking that he had to be clean before he came to Christ. No, you come to Christ and he'll do the cleaning. We get it all mixed up. People think they have to be perfect to come to Christ. No, we go to the perfect one. He's the only perfect one. We go to him. And he's the one that helps us to continue to go forward and to go a little farther. You see... I think he can help us make it through the rest of this life, don't you? Come on. Don't wait for the invitation. What more must Jesus do for you than he's already done? I asked the man yesterday, what more must Jesus do? I'm so thankful for the man, Simon the Cyrenian. He went a little farther with our Lord. He helped carry the burden of the cross on that hill called Mount Calvary that day. I want to end with this. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. You having a hard time? That's your cross. Bear it. You having a hard day? You having a hard week? You having a hard life? Friend, it's not by accident. God gave it to you on purpose to humble you so that you could have an understanding of who Jesus is and what he went through for us. None of us have suffered like our Lord did. We need to thank him. A thankful person is a holy person. An unthankful person is an unholy person. Cling to the cross, your burden he'll bear. Christ has redeemed us once for all. Once for all, O sinner, believe it. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Cling to the cross, your burden he'll bear. Christ has redeemed us once for all. He's not coming back, my friend, to do it all over again. If you could lose your salvation and you cannot, tell them everyone that I told you, you cannot. Because Hebrews chapter 6 says, if we could... It would put Christ to an open shame, meaning that he would have to come back every time that you lose it and die all over again for what you have just done. Can I tell you, he's not going to do it. He's not going to be humiliated again. He's not going to be shamed again. He's not going to be stabbed with a spear again. He's not going to have that crown of thorns on his head again. He's not going to have that mob persecuting him again and wagging their heads and loosing their tongues on him again. God, the Prince of Glory, Jesus Christ, he came once to redeem man, once for all. And I've received him. Christ receiveth sinful men. Do you qualify this morning? Are you a sinner for all of sin and come short of the glory of God? Is it okay if I preach to one today? If you're lost here today without Christ, today is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted hour. You may never have another opportunity again. Brother Mitchell was telling us about a young man who was given the opportunity to be saved and he missed the opportunity. His life was taken in the prison. One was saved and one was not saved. One thief on the cross on one side went to hell. One thief on the other side went to heaven. The one thief who went to heaven went to heaven with one word. He said, Lord, Lord, remember me. One word did it. (laughs) Because it wasn't the word, it was the condition of the heart. The man on the other side, the malefactor on the, the other side went to hell with one word. He said, if, if thou be the Son of God, come down off of this cross and save us, for we perish. Where you at, friend? You either believe or you don't believe. You either going to heaven or you're going to hell. Either you've accepted him or you've not accepted him. I say today is the day. If you've never been saved by God's grace, today is the day of salvation. Let us pray. Father, thank